Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is leader retirement. So the big question we're asking in today's lecture is what happens to leaders after they retire? And as a case study, I want to look into the Iraq War, the most recent Iraq War, the one that got started in 2003. Remember, this was between the United States and Iraq. George W. Bush was the democratically elected leader of the United States at the time. And he is a loser of the Iraq War. Of course, the United States clearly won the Iraq War militarily, but politically this war was a disaster, and it's something that most people in the United States, a vast majority of people in the United States, wish that the United States had never done. But think about what happens to George W. Bush personally. The country loses, but he himself isn't that bad off, right? He spends the next four years still staying in this lovely estate that we like to call the White House, in 2008, by that point, he was extremely unpopular and would have lost re-election had he been able to run, but of course he was term limited out of office, and now he's spending the remainder of his days in a 1,600-acre ranch in Crawford, Texas. So things aren't going very badly for him, especially when you consider that he's charging $100,000 plus in appearance fees, which is substantially less, or rather substantially more than what I charge. So bottom line, for President George W. Bush, Iraq war went very badly for him, and yet he himself is still fine. Compare that to Saddam Hussein, everyone's favorite jovial dictator, father to many, and all-around not-so-good guy. How does this war end for him? Well, he's the real loser of the Iraq war. He loses this both militarily and personally. At the beginning of the Iraq war, he goes into hiding, and about a half a year later, U.S. forces finally capture him. He's hanging around a spider hole. This is not a pretty picture. After that, he goes on trial, and he's hanged. Things go very, very badly for Saddam Hussein in the Iraq War. If you compare this, the democratically elected leader ends up fine, despite the fact that the war didn't go so well for him. But personally, Saddam Hussein, loser of the war, is also a loser personally. So things go well for the Democrat, not so well for the autocrat. And this is going to transition us into the interactive portion of today's lecture. I want you to think about a couple of questions here. So question one, what percentage of Democratic leaders are not exiled, jailed, or killed at the end of their term? Essentially, if you're not exiled or jailed or killed, you're okay. So what percentage of Democratic leaders are okay at the end of their term? And question two is, well, it's the opposite of this. So what percentage of non-democratic leaders are not exiled, jailed, or killed at the end of their term? So what percentage of non-democratic leaders are essentially okay at the end of their term? When you think about this for a moment, pause the video if you have to, and if you have comments available, go ahead and, and put your answers in the comment section, and once you've done that, we will advance past. So let's get to these answers here. Democratic leaders, after they leave office, 93% of them are okay. A very, very large majority of them. In contrast, non-democratic leaders, a slight majority, 59%, are okay after they leave office. Exiled, well, 3% of democratic leaders are exiled after they leave versus 23% of non-democratic leaders. 3% of Democratic leaders are jailed versus 12% of non-Democratic leaders. And here's the big one. Only 1% of Democratic leaders are killed at the end of their office term versus 7% in non-Democratic countries. And in fact, that 7% statistic is actually much worse if we're looking at military dictators. So this non-Democratic leader is lumping together civilian autocrats, military dictators, and also monarchs. But if you just look at military dictators, that killed percentage goes up to 12%. So if you're a military dictator, things are actually really bad for you. If we sum these things up, we see that Democratic leaders only suffer bad outcomes 7% of the time when they have to leave office, but non-Democratic leaders suffer bad outcomes 41% of the time when they leave office. So what we saw in the Iraq War isn't abnormal. That's actually an expectation we'd be much more likely to expect that the autocrat Saddam Hussein ends up poorly after he leaves office versus what happens to George W. Bush after he left office. So that actually matched up to what the statistics say about this. And the moral of the story here is that if you're a non-democratic leader, you really don't want to get kicked out of office. You really want to just stay in office and be happy because, you know, if you leave office, then there's a very good chance that you're either going to be killed, jailed, or exiled. And especially when we're looking at this killed factor here, you really don't want to die. That's very bad for you. Now, why does this matter? Well, outcomes matter. 
Previously, we've only talked about good versus bad outcomes and the incentive for war, but clearly the extent of how bad an outcome can be matters. There's a big difference between, oh, I have to leave office and I have to go retire to a 1,600-acre ranch in Texas and make $15 million a year for the rest of my life. That's not that bad of an outcome versus, oh, I'm going to leave office and be killed. Much worse outcome. So that means non-democratic leaders have incentive to avoid randomly fighting wars. If I'm a non-democratic leader and things are just going peachy in my country, I am in charge of the country, I don't have any serious threats to my power, I'm living in a presidential palace and things are happy for me, I'm getting hourly or I'm getting daily massages for an hour every day and that's great for me and I'm very happy, then what sort of incentive do I have to go out and fight a war? Probably not very much. Even if this war might be good for the country as a whole, even if I'd be doing the thing that the representative citizen would want me to do, I actually might want to play things safe and just not go do it because if I were to go try and do the thing that the country actually would want me to do, even if there's a small chance that things are going to go poorly for me and I'm going to get kicked out of power and I'm going to die as a result, that means I'm not going to be really willing to go ahead and do that. I just want to play things safe, be happy living in my presidential palace, and go about my own business and not get myself involved in foreign conflicts. But that's this big assumption here that everything is going well in this non-democratic country for me and I'm not worried about other things happening in the country. In contrast, if other things are going on and I'm concerned about what's going on in my life and whether I'm going to be around to continue leading this country versus also not just dying, well, then you might get into conflict. And so that's what we're going to go into next time when we talk about when things are going bad in a democratic, non-democratic country, rather, then they tend to get worse. And we'll see why that's the case when we get to the next lecture. Hope you enjoyed this one, and I will see you next time. Take care.